So Heidi Allen, welcome to Acting Prime Minister. Thanks for having us in your office here in Parliament. My Prime Ministerial office, it's huge, isn't it? It's quite hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> Up a little staircase from the travel office and then here we are with your crisps. Yeah, obviously, my crisps. You obviously like your crisps. Um, well, it's more that I do like my crisps a lot. Um, I try and resist the crisps. The crisps are for guests, really, when they come here. Okay, you've got your Pro Plus as well, I spotted. I do have my Pro Plus, yes, essential requirement. <laughs> And a, a quote from Thatcher, so yeah. you're, not, you're not taking that down yet, even though you've left no. the party, it's still obviously something that's important to you. Yeah, she was one of the reasons I joined the Conservatives actually. Um, got, I had uh, My mum died last year, my mum was German, so just used to really strong female characters I think in my life. My mum was a big fan of Thatcher as I was growing up and it just kind of came from there I suppose. And the quote, just if you'd read yeah, it. It's quite apt isn't it? If you set out to be liked, you'd be prepared to compromise on anything at any time and you would achieve nothing. So that appears to be going quite well. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have another quote in your office, yeah. did I just roll my eyes out loud? Yeah. So obviously Thatcher, but with a bit more sass maybe? Is that, um, or, we... just, or just inability to play poker at all. <laughs> so I remember seeing once somebody done a meme of me um, sitting behind John Redwood, I think it was, on the Tory benches. I didn't say anything, but my face said it all. <laughs> okay, well look, we're promoting you from this office okay. into the lovely Downing Street office mm -hmm. now for the afternoon. So you walk through that door of number 10 and you close it behind you, you've just been elected Prime Minister, the first ever independent Prime Minister, mm -hmm. interestingly, you would be. What's the first thing you're going to do? What, what are you, what are you going to buy yourself a gin and tonic or are you going to put up some families of your, photos of your family? What are you going to do? I'd move my cats in, I think, and tell Larry to hop it <laughs> or see if they could be friends, maybe. You could um, have some cute little kittens running around. Yeah, I could, couldn't I? Up or down those stairs. Um, yeah. I, um, I, I sense it's probably um, the whole cat gate would not be an issue I ever will seriously need to consider. But yes, that would probably be my husband also. He should come, I think. <laughs> that would seem like a nice thing to do. But yeah, I'd be worried about how my cats were going to get on with Larry. OK, so you've got some important decisions to make yeah. as well. The phone is ringing off the hook. World leaders want to speak to the new Prime Minister. Who would you pick up? to first? Who would you take the call of first? Um, I think probably, um, assuming this happens quite soon, then it would be a Chancellor Merkel. Okay. Um, because I'd want to um, download all her experience before she leaves the post and um, just start with how she handles Trump. <laughs> I think really any top tips that she could give me one woman to another as to how, well not just Trump as well, but there's quite a few male leaders really around the world. So I'd want her thoughts on how best to do that. And you obviously have a bit of an admiration for her, maybe because of your, your mum. I mean, you just mentioned that your mum was German. and Yeah, j just forthright. I mean, not just women, forthright people in general, but um, somebody who's not afraid to say what they think um, and do brave things. You know, Merkel with the whole refugee thing, a massive, massive mm -hmm. thing for her to do. Um, and I suspect she's, um, she's quite charismatic and um, has a way of achieving things, and I find that interesting. OK, next decision. Everyone wants to know who's going to be in your cabinet. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of names. Who are you going to put in the top jobs, do you think? Um, most of the names I've picked initially have died, unfortunately. I, That's OK. I, this is a fantasy okay, cabinet. So can, you have, can resurrect them. I'd have Mandela or Kofi Annan, I think, to soothe and give some kind of leadership to the group. Um, I'd probably want um, David Attenborough. OK. Very persuasive and could just make sure that we're, um, we don't get distracted by some of the, sort of the petty small policy stuff. We need to think about the big picture and what we're doing with the planet. I'd want a go-getting business person, maybe like Richard Branson, mm -hmm. um, that can really sort of kick butt and get us doing things. Um, and maybe Nick Clegg. I'm not picking many Tories here, am I? <laughs> Nick Clegg, though, interesting. Yeah. If he'd, Why I, Nick I don't Clegg? think he'd come back, to be honest. He's earning quite a lot of cash now. So. Why Nick Clegg? Um, I think he did an exceptional job, actually, in coalition. And ultimately, um, I mean, his career is obviously not doing badly now, but politically speaking, he fell on his sword for his country, I think. You know, he took the hit. The Lib Dems have never recovered since. And I just saw a really, it's a shame I didn't get to know him very well. Um, just gazed at him across the chamber. Um, but he just always seemed very calm, measured, compassionate, smart, just a real balance of a politician, I think. So you sound like you're quite in favour of the idea of coalition, maybe, that mm. you thought he did a good job. So as Prime Minister, would you be happy to have a, maybe a coalition government? Yeah, and that's, um, you have these daft conversations. Who'd be in your cabinet, Heidi? And I, I mean, I've picked some fantasy characters there for fun, but I, um, and I wonder how my new independent group, when we become a party, would feel, you know, if we are honest about this whole non-tribal politics and doing things differently. But I would want the best person for the job. I would want the best expert in education, in defence, and I wouldn't care which party they came from. Um, if they were outside of government but were the best person to advise, you know, I'm very apolitical in that regard. I just, you know, I've run businesses um, and worked in industry all my life. 
all I'm interested in is doing the best job, and if you're doing it for the country, then somebody's politics should be the last thing that's on your mind. Obviously, you have just resigned from the Conservative Party. Maybe you were never that political. Maybe you didn't really need to be in a party, although it's hard to get elected if you're not in a party. Yeah, and the, and the system has always been very difficult to do that, and I recognise that. Um, and I was a Conservative. You know, we've talked about Margaret Thatcher already. I never voted for anybody else. I couldn't imagine ever having been anybody else. But I think in the, you know, being apolitical before, I wasn't involved in politics whatsoever. Um, I didn't join a political party till 2012. And so I had no kind of baggage. Um, all I brought with me was, I suppose, my business acumen and a, and a desire to get things done. And yeah, you've got to join a party. Well, clearly it's going to be the Conservatives. But they've just changed beyond all measure, even in the three years that I've been here. So can we be a bit, be a bit bitchy for a minute then? Oh, Who would you love to sack from the Cabinet? Oh, what, that's in it right now? Yeah. Oh, crumbs. Who do you think it's just, you know, it's just time to get rid? Um, if you could reverse, uh, rewind the question by a few months, Boris definitely would have been the first I would have got rid of. Really? Yeah, um, but alas, he's not there now. Who would I get rid? Um, well, the Brexit secretary isn't really the Brexit secretary. That's kind of a, what do they call it, a private eye? It's a non-job, isn't it? Now, okay, yeah. Um, because he's not really negotiating necessarily, Steve Barclay, he's kind of... Negotiations have mostly been done and yeah. just sort of the Prime Minister's taken them over. So you, you don't think you'd need a Brexit secretary? Well, I suppose um, he, he's not, you know, when it was David Davis or somebody like, or somebody of, um, or Dominic Raab, that was somebody still on a very hard Brexit agenda. I think, in fairness to Steve, he's not the one that's delivering it now, it's the Prime Minister, isn't it? So yeah. that is a bit of a non job, so why would you sack him? Um, I think I, I, it's not a question of sacking, I just want to mostly start again. It's more a question, I think, of a couple I'd keep in. Yeah. Um, Who would you keep in then? I'd That's keep Amber Rudden. Okay. I'd keep Amber Rudden. I think actually David Gork. Mm -hmm. I've got to know David a little bit better since he was Work and Pensions Secretary of State, first of all. Um, but what I, you know, not naming names, I'm tired of seeing fence sitters mm -hmm. that don't recognise the responsibility they have in that job and do something. I, I just, I find it, you know, the party line is one thing, but fight for your country. We need those senior leaders to be fighting for our country now with everything they've got. It feels like everyone's fighting at the moment, though, but you still feel there are, there are fence sitters in politics who yes. are just kind of oh, allowing things yeah. to go How many on. days till Brexit? We have 30. no idea. Mm. How can it be that we have wasted all this time? So that tells me there's been a lack of leadership. OK, OK. Who would you say is your best friend in in Parliament because you know often Prime Ministers like to bring on some of their friends to have that loyalty around them. Who's your best mate do you think in, in, on oh, the back benches or, or the front benches? Um, I'm very close to as you wouldn't be surprised to Anna Subri and Sarah Wollaston because we have really bonded and got very close to each other over you know preparing for for leaving the party. Um, Daniel Zeitner I'm close to actually because he's my neighbour in in the city of Cambridge, we have a lot in common. I talk to Steve Reid a lot on the Labour benches. Um, all sorts of mates. You've got new mates now, obviously, in, in, in the yeah. independent group too. And you had that Nando's the other night. Yeah. Was that your first Nando's? Have you been to Nando's before? <laughs> I have been to Nando's before. OK, all right, I'm patronising a politician now. Yeah. You're very down to earth. <laughs> That's OK. Um, how spicy do you like your Nando's? I like, well, I, all my food is super spicy. OK. Really, really hot. Who was, who's the least spicy of the independent group? Oh, I'm trying to remember. There were a couple of lemon and herbs oh, knocking yeah. around. Mm, bland. Which is just a bit, what's the point? Yeah. Um, That's worrying, isn't it? You can't have a lemon and herb in the independent group, or you'll never have any well, political spice. Well, it's funny, actually, because I was looking at the menu thinking, what should I choose? And the description, of course, because I had the roulette, a little bit of everything. Nice. And um, it said for, for something like those that want to live dangerously. <laughs> it just felt like that kind of day. <laughs> so I thought I have to have that. It's very nice. Excellent. Who was the, like, the least Nando's person, do you think? Anna Subri didn't look like she was loving the Nando's. No, that was a bad photo, okay, right. <laughs> to be fair. Um, she looked like, I don't know, the mum that was supposed to be picking us up to take us all home. Um, I, I'm not, Anna, to be fair to Anna, she does a much better job than I am. I do, for example. And Sarah Wollaston's the same. We're emotional eaters. So if I'm having a good, bad, a tired day, food, <laughs> I eat food. Whereas Anna um, tries really hard to watch what she eats during the week. Okay. So she was being sensible by having a bit of salad and chicken. 
Excellent. Whereas I just fell miserably on all accounts. Well, you can't go to that. I was eating before everybody else was on the photograph. That's just me all over. <laughs> what was that? Was it chicken wings you were yeah. digging into at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a good choice. I, can't, I don't think you can go to Nando's and have a, a salad, personally. Yeah, I think. I would struggle. Anna with has unbelievable self control, clearly. Right, back to you being Prime Minister now. So they want you to give your first speech on the, on the steps of Downing Street mm -hmm. to say, hey, I'm Prime Minister, thanks for electing me. This is the kind of person I am. What personal anecdote do you think you would draw on to give us a sense of who you are as Prime Minister? Oh, gosh. Um, I think probably, and it's one of the reasons I'm sure why I would never get the job, because I'm, I'm not statesman, stateswoman enough, um, stateswoman-like enough, is just um, being in, in politics is amazing, and you have this phenomenal role and responsibility and opportunity to do stuff. But actually, you can't get above your station. You have to remember why you're here. Mm. And it's looking out the window. It's all those people out there bustling about on their way to work, um, jumping on buses, working in hospitals, whatever it might be. And I would want to try really, really hard to connect with people and tell them that I actually am one of them. I'm a bit of an infiltrator. I've got one of us in. And just try and um, remind people. You know, I, I remember putting on my first election leaflet. I'm a, per I'm a person first, a politician second, and I always want to stay that way. And I think people have so fallen out of love with politicians, they hate us. We're worse than estate agents and stockbrokers now, I think. And the only way we will ever hope to break that is by having different kinds of people in here that they can trust and sound and feel like them. So I would want to try and convey that message, I think. It's really interesting that you just said then you don't think you're statesman-like. And yet you want more people to come into politics from all different walks of life. So. Even you think that there is sort of this definition of what it's like to be a statesman or a stateswoman. Um, and you don't think you fit that. It's really I, interesting. I cry all the time. <laughs> I'm terrible. I'm too emotional by half. But can't a Prime Minister cry? Not the UN or something mm. like that. I think that would be Well, a bit there are times to be professional, probably. I guess. But I don't know. Maybe people want to see a bit more emotion from politicians. Maybe that's why they feel disconnected, because they think politicians aren't human enough. I don't know. Yeah, and there is some of that, but I think there has to be a balance. And you have to recognise your own strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'm a very good collaborator. I'm very good at getting people together and to park whatever their prejudices were before they walk in the room. Um, and I think that's more my role. Um, and obviously crying if they don't do what I want them to. <laughs> <laughs> Did you shed any tears over leaving the party? Did you feel kind of that emotional no that and moment. it was interesting of us three um anna was the last person i'd expect to see showing emotion and she nearly lost it yeah briefly. in the speeches yeah. yeah which really surprised me um i i haven't cried no um have i felt um relief absolutely mm. you know people are saying oh how are you feeling Heidi? how are you feeling and i find myself going, oh, i feel like a new woman and actually, I don't. I feel like the woman I used to be. So I just, um, so no, I didn't cry. I was just a really, can, you know, very aware of how, how, would, how would it affect my constituents. I want them to still feel that I'll do a good job of representing them, recognising fully I might fail miserably and out, be out of a job who knows when. Um, but no, you don't, you don't cry about something that's an opportunity. Mm. You grab it and you go for it. So no regrets, definitely None no regrets. Whatsoever. And looking at, the way things have evolved just in the short space of time that you've since you've left the party i mean labor already has changed its position the conservatives have changed their position on no deal do you worry that maybe momentum might run out for the independent group you kind of achieved everything in a space of a week that you sort of wanted to achieve in the short term no because um and, and it's easy and i understand why people think of us about you know stopping brexit or being Romani because that has what's drawn us together sure but actually that was the catalyst that got us all in the same room and it, allowed us to get to know each other but while we've got to know each other we've realized actually i really get on with you you you're sort of saying the same sort of things that i am and it's made us realize that it might be possible to have a party here that isn't obsessively of one ideology or another and it's because you, know, you wouldn't do that in business would you if you were building a team in business you'd pick people that, where you had skills that you needed that you got on you had a shared um desire for the future or a shared ambition that's what would draw you together, not the fact that you started off blue, green, red or yellow or whatever colour. Yeah. Um, so no, I think our job, we, we wouldn't have formed, we wouldn't have left our parties and formed this new grouping just for Brexit, because that's one ticket only mm. and it would fizzle out very, very quickly. No, we are in for the long haul and we want to look at every area of policy. But as you say, Brexit pulled a lot of people towards this movement. 
And now that a couple of those issues in the short term are being resolved in terms of labour offerings, I can referendum, well, it's always are they? out no deal. But are they? Fair question, are they? Mm -hmm. But do you worry that maybe in the short term that's reduced your momentum and that we might not see any defections in the next couple of weeks? It's going the opposite way, actually. Do you think? Yeah, literally. In terms of what people contacting you yeah. saying, I want to move over? Yeah. It's all about the timing when. It's all about my, my local party, how they feel. You know, certainly for the Conservatives, it's that time of year where we have all our AGMs. So there are lots of different influencing um, ideas in people's heads and the timing has to be right, which is why we're not actively canvassing people. Because I don't, you know, none of us want flippant people that go, oh, tell, yeah, I'll join them. We want people who've really thought about it, buy mm. into what we're about and want to be part of it. Um, but yes, there are um, MPs of all stripes interested in joining us. How many Conservatives would you say have sort of floated the idea with you? Um, put it this way, more than we could um, take in. Because, of course, the unique situation that Conservative MPs have to think about compared to other parties is destabilising the government. Uh -huh, and okay. nobody wants a general election. So um, we're having to stem the enthusiasm there. Um, not that we don't love you, um, but just not yet. So you wouldn't actually want too many to defect because then the Prime Minister would lose her majority. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you're talking about you can't really afford to take in more, about, more than about five, really. Yeah, not even that many. Because, yeah, of course, it's, it's double is nine, numbers, isn't it? So four... Four to, four yeah, to nine. two or three more would be as much as we could manage, I think. Okay, interesting. Anyway, back to you being Prime Minister. So you yeah. can pass any bill that you want to pass. What's it going to be? Um, I want it to be all imaginative. Um, right here, right now, it's the deal subject to a people's vote, I'm afraid. Very Brexity, but we just, I can't, you know, not talk about that. But if it was something else, it would be maybe nailing in somehow um, core basic funding for schools. Mm -hmm. You know, the fair funding thing just hasn't worked at all. You know, the government thinks they fixed that, but some schools are sitting on millions of pounds of reserves. One of my schools has got £40 in the bank. Wow, OK. So I would want to do something that set a core funding for schools to open their doors in the morning so that the, the funding could never drop beneath that, something like that, I think. OK, I mean, you could make some big sweeping changes too. Would you scrap universal credit, for example? Um, I would not scrap universal credit, no, but I would... Um, I think that's my postman trying to Is get it? in. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Anything interesting in the post? <laughs> this, this is my this is my third bundle of the day. Um, you had a horrible postcard the other day. I oh noticed. yeah. But I've got a pile of lovely things over there. I could show you. Um, but I did get a horrible postcard, and it just um, oh, it just tickled me really. <laughs> and people going, "What's on the other side?" And pulling apart the grammar and all the rest. Just a bit of fun, really. Um, so you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't no, scrap universal I would credit. I would not scrap that. It, but what I would do um, is it needs. Um, Two major things need fixing with it. Yes, it does need funding in place to get the taper rate right. Um, and the five-week wait needs... Um, well, you either need to get rid of the five-week wait altogether or the advanced loans that we give to people to negate waiting. Um, for those most vulnerable, I would turn that into a grant so it's not repayable. But the biggest thing, actually, yes, of course, the money is important. That's relatively easy, relatively speaking, to fix. It's the culture of the DWP. You know, the I, Daniel Blake film, I am sorry to say is really accurate. If you're that kind of person where you struggle with IT or you haven't got the money to put money on your phone, you can't access a system, it is really heavily IT based. And for those people that don't have the skills that you and I take for granted, the system is like a sausage. It's an impenetrable sausage machine. So I would want to humanise it. OK, OK. All right, we're almost out of time. So I need to give you some more sort of okay. snap decisions as Prime yeah. Minister. Um, would you invite President Trump on a state visit? Because that's going to be looming over. <sighs> The whole state visit as opposed to, I don't know what the other kind of visit working is. Working visit. Yeah. Probably go working. Yeah. Working visit. Okay. No crowns and... No pomp and ceremony. No. What, why? Is that sort of instinctively because of his attitude towards what? <laughs> well, how long I mean, is the list? Well, yeah. Take your pick. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, because I just don't... Um, you, know, you, you know, again, like our independent group, you start off with standards. This is how we operate right, around here. This is our country. So these are the standards we need to see in our fellow leaders. You're very welcome as a working colleague, but, you know, without the horses and the red carpet. OK, fair enough. Um, would you be willing to press the nuclear button? Oh, gosh. Um, well, you'd have to be, wouldn't you, I suppose. Um, but I would um, make sure I was surrounded by the best experts in the business and that everything possible had been done to, um, to you know, to diplomatically to avoid that point. Um, and, yeah, if, if I had failed in that, then I think I still wouldn't, I wouldn't be Prime Minister by that point because I'd be a failed diplomat. So you need to think about your, dime, you, you need to think about your downtime as mm -hmm. Prime Minister as well. 
you've got to think about that recess time. Where are you going to be snapped on holiday, chillaxing like David Cameron? <laughs> um, well, it's my husband and I, when we used to have holidays, um, I don't think I'd be very good Prime Minister, actually, because we used to just literally jump in the car, get to um, Dover in the tunnel through, and we ended up where we ended up. Austria, France, Italy, probably more often than not, because the wine's really good there and they have amazing pizza. Um, so I think the lads in the, you know, the, the vehicle behind us might struggle to keep up, but we'd probably be buying Italian lake somewhere with a great big pizza and some red wine. So you used to just sort of jump in the car and see where you fancied? Yeah, because I'm rubbish at flying. Like fun. Okay, I'm yeah. really rubbish at flying, that's not pretty. So because you find it scary? Or? Yeah, I'm really scared of turbulence. Okay, okay, fair enough. And seeing a larapped Prime Minister, I don't think is a good look, really. Because <laughs> I usually am when I'm flying, so I think driving is better. Sure. Last question, would you ever want to be Prime Minister? I don't think I'm tough enough for it. You can't help but fall in love with the idea. Because in your head, of course, you've got you know children and babies waving at you and everybody loves you. But the reality is, of course, it's not like that. And mm. I'm not sure I could cope with the pressure, being absolutely honest. Um, so if it was um, where everybody loved me, then yes, I would very much like to be Prime Minister. But in reality, I don't think that would happen, so no. What do you think we can learn from the way that Theresa May has, has done it, do you think? What, what, what's her failure been, do you think? Without being cruel, we need leaders with people skills. You know, I believe in all walks of life, whether it's politics, business, in your local community. People, you know, my husband, Phil, was in, in sales and marketing for years. He always said to me, Heidi, people buy things from people they like. Leadership is getting people around that table and wanting to work with you. And then when you have that relationship with people, they, you can perhaps push them in a direction that they weren't necessarily prepared to go before. And you know, that is not her foremost, for, first and foremost skill. Um, so we need a leader with, with great people skills. Do you think that the independent group will ever have a prime minister? I'd Whatever like you to, end up being yeah, called? Yeah, I'd like to think so. But certainly the early days reaction from the general public has been off the scale. They are so hungry for it. And this feels like a people movement, it really does. See, I'd be very disappointed if we didn't achieve that one day. OK, well, we'll wait and see what happens with Indeed. that. But thanks for inviting us into your office. No problem. I've noticed the building works quite nicely yeah. outside, so that's <laughs> the only is. downside to being and also, this close um, to the action. And <laughs> the Prime Minister's PPS used to have an office. Um, I don't know if they still do on the other side, because I remember being in here one night when I had um, one of my team work down here, and the phone rang, and I was like, no, no, tell them I'm not here. And they said, we can see you <laughs> across the corridor as I jumped underneath the desk. So, yeah, that's a bit of an issue. I don't know if it's still there. I don't think they care these but days. You need to just draw so. the curtains. Yeah, I do time. do that quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, look, thanks for being on. You've been no a fascinating problem. acting Prime Minister. And uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.